So, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the second day of our workshop. Um, my name is Arno Rauschenbeutel. I'm from Austria, Vienna University of Technology. And I <clears throat> have the pleasure to chair this morning's session. And the first speaker will be Luis Davidovich. Let me first introduce him. He is professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and he is renowned for his work in uh, decoherence quantum optics, quantum metrology, and um, we had the pleasure to meet first when I did my PhD with Serge Roche uh, in 97, I think, and uh, today he will present a talk on the emergence of the classical world from quantum physics to uh, Schrodinger cat's entanglement and decoherence. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm going to tell you about a uh, problem that actually has uh, been discussed by many people at the origin of quantum mechanics. It is related to the emergence of the classical world from quantum physics. How do you explain the classical world uh, where phenomena typical of quantum physics do not show up? Uh, like super quantum superpositions of states that are very distinct, uh, interference effects between macroscopic objects, and so forth. I'm also going to tell you about uh, new ideas relating entanglement, uh, which is, a, again, an old subject in, 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 in oh, there it is, the, the mechanical pointer, an old subject in, in quantum physics, but uh, uh, you know, recently, with the techniques of quantum information, we have learned lots of things about entanglement. And in fact, we have reached uh, deep knowledge of entanglement and a deep knowledge also of problems which are still uh, open problems in the field, which I'm going to discuss at the end of this talk. Now, so the outline of this talk is the following. First, I'm going to tell you about the the problem of the coherence and the classical limit of the quantum world. Then I'm going to discuss entanglement and decoherence, and I'm going to show you some experimental results on that obtained in, in our group in, in Rio de Janeiro. And then I'm going to actually generalize this discussion to multi-particle systems and uh, discuss the role of, of decoherence when you have many particles entangled. Now, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, our subject is, is, is an old one. In fact, in 1926, in, in one of his famous papers on, on, on the, on the, on the begin, in the beginning of quantum mechanics, Schrodinger was discussing the solutions of the quantum harmonic oscillator. And, and he found it strange that uh, uh, the eigenstates uh, of the harmonic oscillator uh, do not have any similarity with what we have in the classical world. Say, a particle oscillating, at localized and oscillating in a harmonic oscillator. So he, he said, at first sight, it appears very strange to try to describe a process which he previously regarded as belonging to particle mechanics by a system of such proper vibrations. Proper vibrations means uh, eigenstates of the harmonic oscillator, which have oscillations like that. So then he goes on and demonstrates that if he uh, groups uh, these this eigenstates, makes a superposition of them, and he says a group of proper vibrations of quite high quantum numbers and, and of relatively small quantum number differences, this may represent a particle, actually, uh, localized and executing the motion expected from usual mechanics, that is, oscillating with a constant frequency. Now, that was nothing more than the coherent states that we know nowadays, uh, which were introduced in this framework. Schrodinger wanted to have some uh, quantum mechanical description which would be close to the classical situation. Uh, now, he went back to this problem in 1935. Uh, there was a fantastic series of papers by Schrodinger. Uh, in one of them, he discussed the, the Schrodinger cat, which you have already seen yesterday. Uh, quantum superpositions of these macroscopic light states. Uh, and, and then in 1935, he says, uh, an uncertainty originally restricted to the atomic domain 
has become transformed into a macroscopic uncertainty. He was referring to this uh, problem of the Schrödinger cat in which an atom decays. And if the atom does not decay, the cat is alive inside a cavity. If the atom decays, the cat dies. In the middle of the way, the atom is in a superposition of the two states, which means that the whole system has a superposition of states for which in one of them the cat is dead, and in the other one the cat is alive. So he would say uh, this macroscopic uncertainty can be resolved through direct observation. If you open the box, you will see the cat either dead or alive. And then he, do, he, he goes on to say that this inhibits us from accepting in a na naive way a blurred model as an image of reality. There is a difference between a shaky or not sharply focused photograph and a photograph of clouds and fog banks. So there you have, say, a superposition of two coherent states. Uh, each of them is localized. But of course, the superposition of them is not localized. So again, you have this problem of connecting the quantum results with the description of the classical world. Why don't we see in the classical world this kind of superpositions? Now, this is related also to quantum measurements. And that's a, actually a nice example of what Schrodinger said. Suppose you have a detector here that can detect the state, say, of a two-level system. And the system can be in one of two states, say the state psi 1, excited state, or the lower state psi 2. Now, of course, we can always uh, put the atom in a superposition of these two uh, states. And if initially the pointer is in the neutral position, uh, and if uh, psi 1 uh, has the uh, pointer going, say, right, and psi 2 has the pointer going left, then the superposition will uh, produce this state, which is actually an entangled state between the atom and the pointer. Now, uh, I have allowed for the change of the state of the atom in, because of the detection. Now, you see here you could uh, call this uh, a, a, a modified detector because it has uh, one atom, and one additional atom in it, the atom that has just been detected. So here we have a superposition of two states of the detector. And this is a Schrodinger cat. Okay? These are two macroscopic states. And the detection of an atom in a superposition state would lead to a superposition of the positions of the pointer. Now, uh, this is what we would call a Schrodinger cat-like state. Uh, politically correct, we don't have to kill a cat in order to do this experiment. Uh, so uh, it's, it's better to do it in this way. Uh. So that's related to quantum measurement. And of course, the, the, the question here is, you know, why can't we detect that? Whenever you have a superposition of two states, you can have a phenomenon which is called interference, right? You can do interference experiments. Like in Young's interference experiment, you have the state of the photon. You can write it as a superposition of the states corresponding to the two paths. And that gives origin to, to interference. Now, why can't we see interference in this case. Now, this very problem was also uh, subject to uh, questions by Einstein. In fact, in a letter he wrote to Born in 1954, he was talking precisely on this problem. He said, let psi 1 and psi 2 be two solutions of the same Schrodinger equation. Then, of course, the sum of them, since it's a linear equation, also is a solution of the same equation, with equal claim, according to him, to describe a possible real state. And then he says, when the system is a macro system, and when psi 1 and psi 2 are localized or narrow with respect to the macro coordinates, then in by far the greater number of cases, this is no longer true for psi. So what he was saying is that quantum mechanics allows these superpositions of localized states. And then he says, narrowness in regard to macro coordinates is a requirement which is not only independent of the principles of quantum mechanics, but moreover, incompatible with them. Okay? So you see, that's the question. How come we don't see in the classical world these superpositions of localized states? Now, nowadays, we have a, a, an answer to that. Uh, and the answer has to do with decoherence, the uh, entanglement between the system and the environment. And it is actually the same process by which quantum computers become classical computers. So here you have a very fundamental question, 
which is related to a practical one, uh, because uh, the coherence not only transforms quantum systems into classical-like systems, but it can also kill quantum computers. So then questions show up that, like this, uh, can we protect uh, a, a state against the coherence? Uh, are there ways to fight uh, the coherence? Now, these questions are related to the dynamics of the coherence. How does the environment affect these quantum superpositions? And this dynamics of the coherence is related to this elusive boundary, therefore, between the quantum and the classical world. Now, as uh, Serge uh, told you before, the decoherence dynamics was uh, uh, investigated in, uh, in, in his group at Ecole Normale uh, with this cavity QED experiment. The idea is that you have initially a coherent state in a superconducting cavity. Uh, you send an atom through this cavity, as Serge has shown you uh, yesterday, and by, detect, by putting the atom in a superposition of two states and detecting the atom afterwards, you can project the field in the cavity into a superposition of two coherent states. Now, you can send a second atom uh, through the cavity, and the second atom probes the state of the field. So by delaying the sending of the second atom, you can probe the dynamical process by which this coherent superposition becomes transformed into what we call a statistical mixture. <coughs> And statistical mixture means that the cat is either dead or alive, and, and that's not a quantum superposition anymore. So, in fact, uh, the theory on, on this uh, problem and the experiment also showed that uh, this transition from this superposition to the statistical mixture occurs uh, in an exponential way, in a very good approximation, and the uh, decay time is given by the uh, dissipation time of the cavity divided by this quantity here, that's the magnitude square of the coherent state, which is actually the average number of photons in the cavity. So the larger the average number of photons in the cavity, the faster is the decay, and that sort of explains why you can see the superpositions with macroscopic objects. Uh, the coherence is very fast, uh, the faster, the larger the object, and the environment is always there, so it is the environment that produces this decoherence process. And in the image I showed you of the Schrodinger cat uh, in the quantum measurement discussion, uh, I think you could see that. <coughs> you see, here is the, here is the decoherence. Oops. So this is the environment here, and that's the environment. This is the environment that leads uh, the transformation of, from, from a quantum superposition to a statistical mixture. So these animations have uh, this problem. We have to go through, through them. Now, so we decided to ask the same kind of question about the dynamics of entanglement. Of course, you have seen yesterday that entangled states are actually very important for, for, for quantum computation, for quantum information. And the question is, you know, how fast do entangled states decay? What is the effect of the environment on them? So he started to explore this question in our group. And the idea is the following. We take a multi-particle system, initially in an, an entangled state, and we assume uh, that each uh, part of the system, each particle, if you want, has an individual coupling to independent environments. So each particle has its own environment, which is not uh, uh, ne needed really, but just to simplify our discussion here. So each particle can undergo decay, the phasing, the fusion, uh, the usual processes that a particle undergoes in the presence of the environment. So question. How is this local dynamics here related to this non-local loss of entanglement? Uh, second question, how does the loss of entanglement scale with the number of particles? Now, we should imagine, if we think always about this classical limit, that as the number of particles grows up, the uh, decay of the entanglement should go faster and faster. Huh? And that would explain why it's so difficult to find entangled states in the classical world. 
except, of course, for some uh, systems like condensed matter systems. Uh, if you look at the ground state, the ground state is entangled uh, and it does not decay because it's the ground state. Okay? Now, so in order to answer these questions, we need a measure of entanglement. So now I'm going to discuss this problem, how do you measure entanglement and, and how do you define entanglement actually for uh, pure states but also for mixtures. So entanglement is defined by its negative actually. Like, you know, you first define separable states, states that are not entangled. And then entangled states are those that cannot be written in this way. So for pure states, this is a separable state. You can consider that each of these states corresponds to uh, some particle, uh, different particles. And this state is a product state. So we call it separable. It's not entangled. Now for mixed states, the situation is more subtle. We call the state separable if its density matrix can be written in this way. You see here, again, we have a product of density matrix. However, this density matrix is not factorable because you have the sum of products here. You see this is the probability of finding the system in this product. And because this is a mixture, this is just telling you that with some probability p, mu, you can find the state in a separable state. And that's the definition of a separable mixed state. Okay? It's the one which when you measure it, uh, you know, you have some probability of finding it in, in this product of, of, of decimating. So this is just a way of saying that you have some ignorance on the state of the system, besides which, which, which is a classical one. So you don't know if the state of the system corresponds to me equal to one or me equal to two, whatever. But each of these realizations, each of these possible realizations is a product. And therefore, the state is separable. Okay. Now, an entangled state is the defined as, as a non-separable state. And an example of that are the, is the, are the Bell states. These are pure states. And you have here four states. They form a basis in the state of two uh, particles, two qubits. Uh, and they are uh, maximally entangled states. What does it mean? If you, look, if you think about these as spins, spin up or spin down, and you look at the spin of this first particle here, well, you know, there is 50-50 chance of finding it up or down. That means complete ignorance on the state of the particle. So maximal entanglement is really associated to complete ignorance in this case. For, the, for those who know about density matrices, so the corresponding density matrix of this uh, state here is expressed in this way. It just, just tells you that you know, that's the reduced density matrix for each component of the state. It just tells you that there's a 50-50 chance of finding the, the state of each part, zero or one. Now, Schrodinger investigated these states, and, uh, and he made a very modern comment on these states. He said, this is the reason that knowledge of the individual systems can decline to the scantiest, even zero, why that of the combined system remains continually maximal. So you know what is the bell state you have in your hands, but you may not know anything about the state of each part. So best possible knowledge of a whole does not include best possible knowledge of its parts, and that is what keeps coming back to haunt us. This is a nice expression of Schrodinger, and it tells us something that is typical of quantum mechanics, that you don't find in classical mechanics. Uh, you know the globe, you have global information, but you don't have partial information on the system. Uh, typical of quantum mechanics. Now, so I told you that that's a very modern conception, that was a very modern conception of Schrodinger, because actually that comment leads to measures of entanglement. And these measures have to do precisely with the ignorance we have on the state of the partial uh, part of the system. So we can use, for instance, the von Neumann entropy. It's defined in this way, where this, this, this expression here stands for the reduced density matrix of A or B. Or we could, we could use the so-called linear entropy. Again, this is the reduced density matrix of, part, of each part of the system. Now, 
with these definitions, I let you verify. So for the students here, that's an exercise, huh? homework, assignment, OK? So you just verify that if you have a separable state, then the entropy related to this reduced density matrix of each part is equal to 0. So that means no entropy. You know the state of each part because it's a product. On the other hand, if you have a maximally entangled state, this normalization is chosen so that the entropy is equal to 1. Okay? So for two qubits, entropies of each part is 0 for a separable state, and it's maximal for a maximally entangled state, which means maximal ignorance about each part. So inspired by the comments made by, by, by Schrodinger. So that's for, for pure states. Now, for mixed states, the situation is always more subtle. And these are results which have come more recently in the history of quantum mechanics. And for that, they require a mathematical interlude. Uh, I, was, I was told that uh, Hong City University is, is very good at, at TEM, which is TEM. And science is coming now with these new uh, positions. And that means uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Okay? So some uh, in mathematical interlude. Uh, I define here the operation of transposition of a matrix. You may have learned that in, in your undergraduate courses in mathematics. So if you have a matrix here, the transposition means replacing the columns by the, by, by the rows of the, of the matrix. So you just transpose, you transform this into this. And, and this matrix here, this is the density matrix say, of, 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 a, of, a of, of a qubit. And that's written in the so-called computational basis, which is the product basis made of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Now, this operation is a positive operation. Uh, you can show that it does not change the eigenvalues. So it takes a density matrix, which is a positive uh, matrix. It has all its positive eigenvalues into another density matrix, actually with the same eigenvalues. OK? It does not change the eigenvalues. Now, However, there is another operation related to that, which is the partial transposition. So suppose you have two qubits, for example, you have this state here. And then you write down the density matrix corresponding to this state, which is a 4 by 4 density matrix. So now you have two qubits. And the partial transposition means that you transpose just part of the system corresponding, say, to system B. Uh, which means, you know, in this matrix here, you take this block here, you put it here, and this block you put here, just transpose part. You don't transpose this part here. Uh, now, if you do that, you transform this matrix into this one. I just interchange this with this. And now you can calculate the eigenvalues of this matrix here. And you find that it has a negative eigenvalue. Okay? So even though transposition is a positive operation, partial transposition, in which you keep one system without changing it, and just make the transposition on the other subsystem, that's not a positive transformation. Okay? So we say that, therefore, the transposition is not a completely positive operation, because when applied to just part of the system, it does not transform a density matrix into a density matrix. Okay? That's for mathematics. And there is a whole I mean, mathematical uh, study on this kind of transformations. OK. So we can use this as a criterion for entanglement. Suppose you have a separable uh, system, uh, state of a system. So the density matrix can be written in this way. Now you make the partial transposition of this uh, density matrix. That means that you transpose only the B part, not the A part. So you have this, uh, now this state here. Now you see, if the state is separable, the partial transposition is actually the complete transposition of part of the system, because it's separable. Which means that this is also going to be uh, a density matrix. It's a positive uh, uh, state. OK? So if you have that, and if you apply the partial transposition, then you get, again, a positive uh, operator. So this was pointed out by Asher Peres in 1996. And he showed that, therefore, that if rho is separable, then the partially transposed matrix is positive. Okay. So this relates the criterion for recognizing entanglements to uh, uh, 
new results actually in mathematics uh, relating, uh, uh, related to these complete positive transformations. Now, later on, actually the same year, it was shown by the Horodetsky family, uh, means Horodetsky, 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 and Horodetsky. Uh, uh, you know, you have a, a father and, and, and uh, the, the three children, and, and even, I mean, the, the, the mother also works on the same subject, which is, of course, quite proper for the family to work on entanglement, right? I mean, we could not imagine otherwise. Uh, it's an entangled family. So the Horodetsky family showed that for two by two and two by three systems, two by three means you know a qubit in a, a state with three levels, a system with three levels, uh, two by two by two and two by three. For two by two and two by three systems, rho is separable if and only if it remains a density operator under the operation of partial transposition. So this is not an if and only if. So it's, it just says that if rho is separable, then this holds. Now they show that at least for these systems, this is actually a necessary and sufficient criteria. Okay, so now we have this criterion, and we can e even use these negative eigenvalues that show up as uh, a measure of entanglement. And this has been proposed, and it is used, it will be used by us. So we define the negativity as the sum of the magnitudes of the negative eigenvalues of the partially transposed matrix. Okay, just a definition. And we, me we, we define uh, the measure of entanglement in this way. This normalization is put here so that this negative, negativity is equal to one for a Bell stage. For dimensions higher than six, n equal to zero does not imply uh, separability. It's not if and only if anymore. Uh, and in fact, there are entangled states with dimension higher than six that, are, that have zero negativity. Okay? These are called bound entangled states. Now, there is another measure which was proposed in 1998, uh, which is the concurrence. And again, it's a, it's a non-trivial mathematical definition. You take your density matrix, uh, or say of the two qubits, you calculate this thing, you see there is here a conjugation in, the con in this uh, product basis of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And, and then you calculate the eigenvalues of this uh, this matrix here. And then you build this expression here for this capital lambda. Okay. This is, these are the eigenvalues in decreasing uh, order uh, of, uh, of magnitude. And you calculate this lambda. And then you define concurrence as the maximum between 0 and lambda. So if, if this is positive, you have some concurrence different from 0. If lambda is negative, then the concurrence is 0. And for a 2 by 2 system, there is no entanglement. The system is separable. Okay? So what Wouters showed is that zero concurrence for a two qubit system means separability. Uh, otherwise, you have the concurrence different from zero uh, and positive. Uh, in particular, if C is equal to one, the system is maximally entangled, like a Bell state. If C equals to zero, as I mentioned, it's separable. So we have here two definitions, negativity and concurrence. So you might be happy about that. OK, very good. We have many possible definitions of, of entanglement. But I'm not happy about it. And I'm not happy because they do not coincide. OK? So uh, this was a study made by, uh, well, let's, let's uh, just not, I'm not going to discuss this. So uh, Ferstrade showed in, in 2001 uh, this relation between concurrence and negativity. Here's the negativity, here's the concurrence. Of course, at least, uh, when they are both zero, that means that there is no entanglement. They coincide on that. Uh, when they are both one, this is for two uh, qubits. Uh, when they are both one, it's maximum entanglement. Uh, but you know, in the middle here, they do not coincide. Like for instance, take this point here and this point here. They have the same entanglement according to concurrence because they are, they are along a vertical uh, line, but they have different negativities. So according to negativity, one is more entangled than the other. According to concurrence, they have the same entang entanglement. Furthermore, you can even have you know, one state with concurrence larger than the other, but negativity smaller than the other, which means that you have to take these measures with a grain of salt. Okay? It's, uh, uh, you, you must know what you are talking about. Okay? So they, they, they work here and here, but along the way, uh, 
uh, they do not coincide. On the other hand, as I mentioned, the bound of separability is independent of the entanglement measure. Any entanglement measurement you, you want to build must satisfy this. Now, so let me now uh, show you some peculiar uh, effects of the, of the environment on, on entanglement by using uh, a simple example, uh, which is described by this equation here. So let us understand this. So I have now uh, this uh, two-bit state, zero and one. And just for, f for thinking physically about it, let's suppose that zero corresponds to the ground state of some atom, and, and one corresponds to the excited state of an atom. And then I'm going to write this uh, equation here, which tells me that if the atom is in the ground state and there is no excitation in the environment, for instance, no photons, the atom remains there in the ground state with zero photons in the environment. On the other hand, if the atom is in the excited state and there are zero excitations in the environment, you have two possibilities. There is some probability that the atom stays excited and then there will be no excitation in the environment. And there is also probability that the atom undergoes a transition from the excited to the ground state with one excitation in the environment. Okay? So just that just describes the decay of a two-level atom. Now, you see that I have this parameter here, which is the probability of, of, uh, of uh, 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 decay. And we can, for instance, take P as the period of time in this way. You see now 1 minus P means exponential of minus gamma T. The square root, you have exponential of minus gamma t over 2. So that's just the probability amplitude of finding the system in the initial state, in the excited state. And that's just saying that you have an exponential decay of this, uh, this probability of finding the atom in the initial state. Yeah. So now if we do that, this kind of equation, which you call a map, it's mapping the initial state into the final state, uh, coincides with the usual master equation for the K of a two-level atom upon tracing on environment. So you, you mean you forget about environment, you concentrate on the atom, and then you can have a master equation, and in the Markovian approximation, you get the same solution, either solving this equation or solving for, for this map. Same thing. But you know, this map is, of course, very intuitive, and in fact, it corresponds to something Weisskopf and Wigner did in 1930 very old theory in, in atomic physics. They wanted to describe the decay of an atom using actually the Dirac equation. Uh, and, and they had a map corresponding to this. They make an assumption that only two states of the environment were important, the state without photons and the state with one photon. Okay? So that's, that's precisely what we have here. Now, so our strategy in the following is to consider the evolution as a function of P, not T. Of course, P depends on the time. Uh, and we are going to do, follow this strategy for two reasons. First, it's more general, because P could be an exponential decay, or it could be anything. It could be an oscillation, for instance. Uh, so we'd have radio oscillations instead of a decay. So it's more general in this way. Second reason is that, as I am going to show you, uh, there is an experiment that you can do uh, that realizes this map, and which is a function of P. Okay, so it's easier to do it in a, a, experimentally. So the idea then is the following. Suppose you have two qubits, two, two level atoms. They are entangled. Uh, and you want to know how this entanglement is affected by the decay of the atoms, shown by this equation here. So we apply, we start with an initial entangled state. We apply this map to each of the two atoms. Uh, let it evolve and then trace out the environment. Uh, it's a mathematical operation that corresponds to ignoring the environment and focalizing your attention on the, at on the two atoms, on the two atomic states. So that's what we do. So then we will have a two qubit reduced density matrix. It's a, it's a density matrix just of the atomic system. And if I have a density matrix, I can now calculate the negativity by doing partial transposition or the concurrence uh, and measure the entanglement. Okay? So that's the idea. Now, if you don't understand some part of what I'm saying, please interrupt me. Huh? OK? So that's the idea. Yes. 
So what does 1E mean if you have two systems then in principle uh, if they are if the two atoms are separated by more than lambda yeah, sure. then it's two different E's right so you yeah. have to put an E prime very good okay. yeah so that's just for one atom then I'll have uh, uh, should have E1 and E2 yeah and that's what we have okay yeah two different E's two different G's also okay but they both evolve and they are entangled so now we will be able to, by doing that, we'll be able to actually to calculate the entanglement and see how this is the dynamics. Okay, instead of doing the theory of that, I'm just going to show an experimental result, okay, which was done in our group. Very simple uh, experimental uh, arrangement. And the idea is, is the following. Uh, we want to implement this map. That's the map I showed you before. And now we are going to make a slight uh, modification of this map, just changing the notation. Uh, in, instead of having G and E here, I will have H and V, two polarizations of a photon. So remember, the horizontal polarization corresponds to the ground state, the vertical polarization corresponds to the excited state. Uh, and that's the map I had before. Now I have this system here, which is the following. This is a polarized beam splitter. Uh, it's like a, a traffic uh, <coughs> police, okay? If the, if the uh, photon is horizontally polarized, it goes through. If the photon is vertically polarized, it is reflected. So it's sensitive to the polarization of the photon. Now these are mirrors. Here I have a half-wave plate, which we can rotate. This half-wave plate transforms, say, a vertical polarization into a superposition of vertical and horizontal polarization. It rotates the polarization. There's another half-wave plate, which is always at zero angle, just to compensate the optical path uh, of the two uh, paths. And, 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 and now we can follow what happens with the photon if it has horizontal polarization or vertical polarization. Let's ignore for the moment this half-wave plate. Uh, by the way, this is what we call a Sagnac interferometer, but it's a, I call it Sagnac-like because the two paths are not superimposed. Uh, they are they are separated so, so that they can act on one path independently of the other, okay? So let's follow now what happens with a horizontally polarized photon. So here he comes. It goes through the polarized beam splitter. It is reflected and it comes out this way. And I call this path here the zero state of the environment, okay? So I'm calling the environment the actually the spatial path followed by the atom. And what this polarized beam splitter is doing it is coupling the horizontal state of the photon with this path. Okay. Now, what I have just shown you corresponds to the first equation in this set of equations. H0 goes into H0. I call zero this path which I have just described. And I'm very proud of this animation because it took me a long time to do it. So I hope you appreciate it. Now, so now suppose I have a vertical polarized photon that comes in. So this vertically polarized photon is going to be reflected here. It goes this way, this way, this way, this way. And here it is reflected again. Uh, so it comes out also in zero. And that corresponds to the second equation when P is equal to zero. Okay? V0 becomes V0. Now I can change P by rotating this half-wave plate here. So if I do that, and I consider now this half-wave plate with some angle different from zero, the V polarization that goes this way will become a superposition of V and H. I call P equal to sine squared of two theta. That's the probability of having this H component here. And now let's see what happens. We have this vertical polarization now. Here we get the superposition of horizontal and vertical polarization. Uh, the red sphere goes this way, the blue polarization goes this way. So now you have uh, this second equation here because you have a component horizontally polarized which is in a different path, which is path one. Okay. So you see that with theta different from zero, now we have both terms. Part of the vertical polarization has come this way, so that's this term here, and the other part has gone and the horizontal component has gone this way, which is this part here. Okay? So that's a, an optical way to implement this map. Now, 
what we have to do now is to analyze the density matrix uh, of this uh, qubit. It's just a qubit, horizontal and vertical polarization, just one particle for the moment. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, you know, we have, as I mentioned before, we have to trace out the path. Uh, we don't want to look at the environment. We just want to look at the, at the polarization. So we just join the path here in this polarized beam splitter. So now I don't have information on the path anymore. Uh, and I do polarization uh, uh, tomography, which is done by this half-wave plates and quarter-wave plates here. OK, so that's the idea, uh, just for one photon. So second step, we do it now for two photons. Uh, so we have now uh, a crystal here that produces an entangled state of the two photons. And now I have an environment potential marks here for this first photon in another environment, similar environment for the second photon. We do the same thing. See, we join the paths here. We are not interested in environment now. And we do joint tomography detected on coincidence, in coincidence in between the two photons. OK? So by doing that, we are reconstructing the density matrix of the photon pair, the polarization density matrix. Okay? Then we can calculate the concurrence. You remember the, the large lambda we had before? Uh, the concurrence is the maximum between zero and, and, and lambda. Uh, and, and lambda can be measured because it's related to the eigenvalues, or it can be calculated from the density matrix because it's related to the eigenvalues of the density uh, matrix. And then we find this. So this is, uh, uh, this is the expression for the concurrence. Just remind you of that. So whenever lambda is negative, the concurrence is zero, so the state is separable. Now, so this is lambda as a function of p. From the definition of p, you see p equal to zero corresponds to t equal to zero in that expression I gave you. Uh, p equal to one so, uh, means maximum probability of, of transition, so t equal to infinity. And you see that depending on the initial state, you may have this blue kind of behavior here for the concurrence. So the entanglement vanishes only when p is equal to 1. That means infinite times. It's a decay which is almost exponential, actually, within a very good approximation. And this happens, you know, this blue curve here, uh, happens when, when beta is equal to alpha over t. These are the coefficients of the entangled state. And, and, uh, and uh, and the red curve corresponds to beta is equal to 3 alpha. So the red curve happens when this coefficient is bigger than this one, which means what? More entanglement between the system and the environment, right? Because the excited state is stronger in, in, in its presence than the ground state. And that's the excited state that produces the entanglement because it emits a photon, say, it emits an excitation. So in this case here, if beta is larger than alpha, you have this red curve here. And you see then that entanglement now vanishes for a, for a value of p, which is not equal to 1, which would correspond to a finite time disappearance of entanglement. Okay. So clearly, it's not exponential decay, uh, because otherwise, entanglement would decay only at infinite times. It also shows that entanglement can be very sensitive to the coherence. In fact, even in this region here, we can show there is still coherence between the two states, but there is no entanglement anymore. Okay, so entanglement decays, is entanglement disappears before coherence disappears. Well, this has been shown in the literature sometimes as entanglement sudden death. Uh, well, I don't know, it's not sudden because uh, it happens and it continues up to this point, but it disappears at finite times. Now, in this experiment here, I show you that we joined the paths because we didn't care about them, right? So we just do, did polarization tomography. But then we might ask about the role of environment. Huh? And, and then we'll be doing something different from what one usually does. So usually one traces out the environment and one looks at irreversible evolution of the system, as I have just done. Now, question, as the entanglement decays and eventually disappears, what is its imprint onto the environment? What happens with the environment? Now, actually, we can do that in this experiment. We can do this by just 
to failing to join the two paths at the exit of this interferometer. And we do tomography now of both polarization and paths, okay? which is a subtle thing to do. We have done that in our lab. We have to mark the path with a polarization, and then we can do uh, uh, this complete tomography. I'm not going to go into the details here. So we do a full tomography of the full state, uh, including polarization and paths. So this is the situation we had before. This is the situation we have now, where you do this combined uh, tomography. And this was actually motivated by some work by, by Wojciech Zurek, which was called Quantum Darwinism, in which he showed that if you have a, a classical-like state, say a coherent state in a cavity, the imprint of this coherent state on the environment has some redundancy. You have, say, too much information, which is related to the fact that if you have, if you have a classical system, in principle, you don't need to measure the whole environment. You can measure just part of the environment to have information on that system. While for a quantum system, that does not occur. So that uh, motivated us to look at the environment in this case of, of decay of, of entanglement and to see if, if it could uh, help us to understand uh, some these dynamics of decay in a better way. So the model we, we considered was the same as before. We have these two systems here. They are entangled. And each of them uh, is interacting with its own environment. We consider, again, the map that I showed you before, which is called amplitude map. Okay? The amplitude is decay. Yeah? And, 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 and then we looked at this uh, complete tom tomography. And then you find some, some, some things uh, very curious about it. So again, this is the concurrence. Eh? Forget about the word tangles. This is the concurrence of the atomic system. Let me say like that, just to give a physical realization. This is polarization, eh? the state of the atoms. So that's the entanglement of the two systems. And that's, in blue, you have here the entanglement of the two environments, the two paths. <laughs> And then you see something funny, because the entanglement of the two systems disappears. And then later on, the entanglement between the two paths shows up. In between, something happens. Question, what's going on there? That the entanglement disappears, stays dormant for some time, and then oops, it appears again. So we studied that, and we, what we showed is that in the middle of the way, you have what we call genuine entanglement between the particles and the environment. Genuine entanglement means that we are close to this kind of state here. And this state is not be separable. In other words, if you take, say, the, the entanglement between two parts, it's always zero. But the entanglement is there, of course. This is not a separable state. Okay? So in this dynamics, if you consider the environment also, you see that, you know, this is precisely the place where the entanglement in the system disappears, and then you start having multipartite, genuine multipartite entanglement, and then the multipartite entanglement uh, goes actually to zero, and then the entanglement in the, the, in the, in the pass uh, uh, shows up. Now, you see that there is a two-thirds here, and that's uh, some work which was done uh, in, in, in this paper here that shows that if the fidelity between the state we get experimentally and this state here is larger than two thirds, we can say that is, that is genuine entanglement. Okay? It's, it's called the weakness of entanglement. I'm not going to go into details here. So, but it's possible to show that at this point in, in this region, you have multi genuine multipartite entanglement. And, and then in those two regions, you just have entanglement in the system or in, in, in the spatial part. So all I have told you up to now is about two qubits. So how can we generalize this to uh, n qubits in other kinds of environments? So we started to discuss these problems in this paper here. And just to uh, set the definitions uh, simple, uh, I will start with this state here. Now, this symbol means that I have a product here of two 
of n zero states. Uh, it's a tensor product, n zero states. Tensor product of n one states. Actually, this state here is like the state was, which was shown to you by, by David uh, yesterday on ions, uh, uh, which uh, in his discussion on quantum, on quantum metrology, right? It's, uh, so say like spin up, 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 or plus spin down, down, down. Okay. So we start with this state here, and we look at the time-dependent behavior of this state. This is theoretical work now. Actually, Rainer Blatt has done an experiment on that with ions, right? Uh, <coughs> about the, the coherence of this entangled n qubits. So, we again, we again consider amplitude dumping. So we start with this stage. Amplitude dumping means, you know, decay of the atom. Mm -hmm. and, and then we have shown some very curious results. You know, we take that state and take any bipartition. That means, you know, put uh, k atoms one on side and minus k on the other side and look at the entanglement between them, between these two groups of atoms. And then what uh, we show is that there is a critical transition probability, a critical value of p for which negativity vanishes. And we also have shown that for this state here, negativity is necessary and sufficient for entanglement. Okay, special case. So in this critical transition for which the entanglement vanishes is given by this expression, it does not depend on the partition. All kinds of partitions, the entanglement vanish at this point, vanishes at this point. And this expression here, you see, is very simple. It depends on these two coefficients, and it depends on n. But it has a peculiarity which is very disturbing. Okay. See, suppose magnitude of alpha is smaller than magnitude of beta here. So this quantity here is smaller than one. So you have here a number which is smaller than one raised to the power two over n. Now, you see that this critical value here approaches one when n goes to infinity because when n goes to infinity, this exponent goes to zero, and therefore this approaches one. And I find that very disturbing. I hope you find too, because that's showing that the larger the system, uh, the more resilient it is against the coherence. Uh, it will only, uh, the entanglement will only disappear at infinite times uh, when n goes to infinity. You know, looks like something is wrong here. Uh, so we decided to look at this in more detail. We, I'm not exaggerating, I'm not dramatizing. We're very disturbed by these results, <laughs> okay? Very disturbed. Uh, and this work was done, uh, people, maybe some of you know, uh, Leandro Olita, and uh, he was in Innsbruck, uh, and, yeah. So, let's look at this with more details. So, forget about this uh, map here, it's not the amplitude map, but it's the same thing. So, here is the, uh, shows the decay of entanglement for 4 qubits, 40 qubits, 400 qubits, and you see that, indeed, the uh, entanglement disappears at longer and longer times. But you also see that for 100 qubits, this uh, concurrency or negativity is very, very small. In fact, if you enlarge this, you see something like this. So this is the plot I showed you before. And in fact, the whole plot about the negativity is like this. This is for 4 qubits, 40 qubits, 400 qubits. We are just looking at this part here where indeed the, four, the entanglement for 4 qubits disappears before the entanglement for 400 qubits. But you see, the entanglement for 400 qubits is extremely small before that. So the system goes into coma before it dies. <laughs> <laughs> Very small negativity, and in fact, any small perturbation here will make the entanglement disappear. Okay? So that's the classical limit in this case. That's the classical limit in this case. Uh, we can show also that the, uh, this uh, negativity here goes, you know, for a fixed p, goes exponentially uh, to zero as a function of n. Okay. Now, further generalizations of this came with, the, with, the, uh, with some work uh, in collaboration with Antonio Asin also. Uh, Rafael Chavez and Leandro Olito were my students, they are now professors. Daniel Cavalcanti was at IFO at that time. 
And, and we also analyze uh, uh, graph states. Uh, graph states are built like that. You consider a set of, of dots and connections between them. At each vertex, place a qubit in this superposition state. And then you apply the phase gate between two connected vertices. What does it mean? Suppose you have a qubit here and another qubit here. So you have these two qubits here. You apply this control phase operation on them. So that means that when you get one one, you change the phase. This, I think, was discussed by Reiner in his talk right away. So, okay, so this state gets transformed into this one. This is clearly a separable state. It's a product state. This is not separable anymore. It's an entangled state. And you do that with all the vertices here. Okay? So you produce in this way a state which is called uh, graph state, which, is, which was shown actually by Rosendorf and, and Briegel to be universal states for measurement-based quantum computation. It's a quantum computation in which you start measuring the qubits initially in this state, and each measurement depends on the result you got for the, the previous measurements. So these are concatenated measurements. So what we have shown for these states is, is that uh, lower bounds for the entanglement depend only on the number of uh, boundary qubits. So suppose you have a system like this, you have three parties, and you want to know what's the entanglement between them, well, we show that any measure of entanglement you could invent, right, it's not, it does not depend on any specific measurement, you know, it should satisfy some general properties like, you know, should not increase other, other local operations and things like that. Uh, then the decay of entanglement depends only on the boundary qubits. It does not depend on what happens here. So it means that these states are more resilient to the coherence, are more resistant than this data I showed you before. So just a generalization. Now, uh, I would like to finish by first uh, directing those of you who are interested in, in, in learning more about this to this review paper, which was published with two former students of mine, Leandro Olita and Fernando de Mello, in reports on, on progress in physics. It's a review. Uh, of this uh, uh, theme, and, and, and I would like to finish with some you know, general considerations on, 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 this, uh, on this problem of entanglement. You know, I think we have gone a long way since these headlines in New York Times showed up. This was the news about a famous paper published by Einstein with Podolsky and Rosen known nowadays as the EPR papers, paper, in which they really put the finger in a very uh, subtle problem of quantum mechanics. Uh, I think the conclusions they had are not considered correct nowadays, but anyway, they were very clever to put the finger there. Huh? And, and in fact, this was published in, in, uh, in the New York Times on May 3rd, the paper was published only on May 15. That was a physical review paper. And Einstein was mad with his collaborators because he wanted to know who leaked the news. He didn't like the idea that the paper was published in New York Times, uh, the news, before the paper was published in physical review. He didn't, he didn't like the, 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 the marketing on that. And in fact, he got into bad terms with Boris Podolsky because he found out that Boris Podolsky leaked the news. Anyway, so that's a that's, that's, uh, uh, funny story. But you see, since then, we have learned a lot about the tenements. I think in the, in the round table yesterday, when, when we were discussing these things, and what, what quantum information has taught us uh, about quantum mechanics, and I think had, it has deepened our understanding of quantum physics. You know, who could imagine that those uh, effects discussed by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, and also Schrodinger were related to some deep mathematical structures uh, of complete positive operations. Who could imagine that uh, entanglement could be used as a resource uh, for quantum uh, communication tasks, that higher order correlations in quantum mechanics would be discovered, like the one leading to teleportation, uh, which also deserve headlines in, in newspapers. So lots of things happened. Uh, which uh, ended up with this very interesting association 
between quantum physics and information theory. So you see that uh, the, even the measure of entanglement was related to von Neumann's entropy, which is a direct link between inf quantum information theory and, 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 and quantum physics. Now, I would like to finish by just mentioning uh, my collaborators in this uh, area of research. Uh, so all of them here were, were students uh, uh, in my group, not necessarily my students. Uh, Marcelo was a student of Paulo Souto Ribeiro, Gabriel Aguilar also. Uh, Alejo was a student of uh, Matos Filho. Uh, and, and they are now professors actually in several places, uh, postdocs. Osvaldo is a recent one, uh, postdoc. Andrea was uh, from Mexico. She was a postdoc in our group. She worked on these two. These are colleagues, uh, they are collaborators. Paulo Soto Ribeiro and Stephen Walborn are the magicians who build up the quantum optics lab in my group. I would, of course, as you can figure, I would be unable to do that. Uh, uh, it would be a tragedy if I tried to. Uh, so they did uh, this, this, this work. And Daniel Cavalcanti uh, uh, working on the theory. He's, uh, uh, he was uh, in ICFO, I think he's now in Singapore. Antonia Sin in ICFO. Joe Everly in the United States, uh, University of Rochester. Xiao Feng Qian was a postdoc of Everly at that point. And that was the work on, on uh, entanglement dynamics. Now, we also had uh, work on quantum metrology. And these are the people who worked on that, uh, also former uh, students. Uh, Bruno is now a professor at the Federal University. Those three are, are postdocs. And Nisim Zaguri and Rui Nebatos Filho are colleagues that have uh, uh, collaborated for a long, long time on many, many problems in physics. And I owe a lot to them. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the clear and fascinating talk. I'm sure there are questions. just flows from the system to the environment. And, but if you look at the whole system, it never really dies. It just uh, does look like from subsystem, right? Uh, do you call me? Uh, I mean, uh, the entanglement seems flow from the system to the, the environment, yes. but it never really dies out, right? Yeah. So in this case, no. Yeah. So uh, it seems to me that is there any conversation law or conversation quantity in this process? OK, very good question. Uh, the general answer is no. OK, general question, there is no conversation of entanglement. Uh, and you can see that because you, if you start with some initially free particles, they interact, then entanglement shows up. So it was not there before. Uh, and it shows up because of the interaction. However, uh, we, can do, we can write some inequalities regarding uh, entanglement. Uh, that are related to several funny quantities that we call tangles, and uh, it's not just bipartite entanglement or even genuine entanglement. There are other things that come yeah, up. Yeah. And in this review paper I mentioned, you'll see these inequalities there uh, regarding entanglement. Okay? But you know, in general, no conservation of entanglement. Oh, okay. thanks. So the next question was there. Maybe you pass the micro mic. Uh, would you entertain a question from a non-physicist? Of course. Thank you. So uh, first question I'd like to ask you is, what's the difference between von Neumann entropy and Shannon's entropy? I sense a similar expression, but what is the difference and what's the motivation for the von Neumann entropy? Very good, very good. So of course, Shannon entropy was a classical entropy. Uh, entropy depends on the density matrix of the system. So you can say that it's a, a generalization of Shannon's entropy, if you want, for quantum systems. Okay? So that's, I think, the simplest way to explain it. Well, then uh, I have a little trouble understanding Shannon's entropy. I don't see a motivation, and there are many papers written questioning it. Uh, is there a motivation for the von Neumann entropy that is strongly grounded in physics? Okay, sure. Very good. So uh, actually, it's not different from the 
motivation of Shannon's entropy, because you know, Shannon's entropy in some way measures our ignorance on, yeah. on, on, on the system. Huh? You have some data, huh? and, and that measures the ignorance you have on the data. Uh, von Neumann's entropy, the same thing. Okay? You saw that in this case, applied to uh, entangled states, it was actually measuring the ignorance we have on each subsystem. And in fact, they are the mathematical realization of the sentence of Schrodinger, which I found very nice because it was a long uh, time ago when he said that, you know, we have this phenomenon, entanglement, by which, you know, we can have complete information on the global system and yet have no information on each part. Yeah. And the phenomenon entropy is precisely measuring this. Okay. I have other questions, but I should yield the floor. Yes, the, the next question is over there. Thanks. Um, another entropic question, actually. Um, so, the, a separable state has an entropy of zero, an entangled state that you showed has an entropy of one. Pure states, a, yeah. A, you say a pure, pure entangled state has an entropy of one. Um, the universe tends to like to go from entangled to not entangled. Can you comment on what's happening from a sort of second law perspective with that? Because it seems to be going the wrong way. Uh, from, from entanglement to non-entanglement, let's see. Uh, Which would, would seem true. to be making entropy go down. Yeah, because now we are talking about the whole thing. Huh? I was talking about uh, the part of the whole thing. Huh? So that when I say that Bell states corresponds to the maximal entropy, it's maximal, uh, or to the minimum entropy, I'm sorry, it's the minimum entropy of each part, because you don't know anything about each part. Okay? So, but of course, I'm not referring to the whole thing. If you look at a Bell state, the entropy of the full uh, Bell state is zero, because you know it. Huh? It's only about each part. So this refers to parts of the universe, and that's just telling you that what you are losing information about the parts. Now, of course, if you look at the whole universe, then you cannot even say that you know. I mean, there's several. <laughs> there are there are lots of discussions about that, but you know, I abide for for the for the uh, for simple reasoning that quantum mechanics describes correlations between parts of our universe. So I don't see any meaning in the wave function of the whole universe. OK. Are there more questions? Uh, maybe I can ask a question. So uh, I, uh, this, this link between the negativity and the concurrence, that seemed so general. But I mean, was it a calculation for a certain dimension of the system? Or does that apply to any dimension? So. Uh, that was that calculation was done for two qubits, oh. and in fact, it was a numerical thing. They just, you know, they ran, randomized their states. They made, they actually let the computer do that. Mm -hmm. huh? They produced, you know, lots of lots of states, and then they calculated the concurrence and the negativity for each one. That's why you have this green region here. You know, that's the, that was numerically done. Huh? Now, uh, of course, the the fact that you have this uh, this uh, distinction between the two measures. Uh, led us to do this work on graph states in which we don't have to specify any measure. Our results came from some general properties any measure should have, like for instance, should be zero for the separable state, huh? should not be changed, should not be increased under local operations, because you know, we cannot <laughs> increase entanglement between local operations and classical communication. And if you just put this, you know, uh, uh, properties there, start with them, very general, then you find our results, okay? And I think that's a good way to do it, not specify any, any kind of measure, but, but deriving results for general measures which satisfy some basic properties. Mm -hmm. Okay, Serge? Yesterday during, the, yesterday during the round table, you mentioned at the end that one aspect of all this uh, quantum information and quantum uh, experiments could lead to tests of quantum oh, yeah. physics, and here you did not address this issue because I think what what people are what some people are worried about when you talk about Schrodinger cat is not the disappearance of the coherence; it is the fact that you find it either dead or alive, and no, nothing tells you which outcome right. will come out. Yes, yes. So can you? Sure. Very good. Very good. Well, I welcome this question because I was going to comment on that at the end, and I forgot. <laughs> okay. I forgot my general remarks. So first, 
you know, I told you about the coherence. And actually, in the beginning of my talk, I told you there are some open questions, you know, important open questions. But I forgot to mention that at the end of my talk. Huh? And, and, and only Serge noticed that. Huh? that <laughs> okay. so, anyway, so, but that's, a, that's an important point. Uh, you see, uh, there are questions that show up like this. Uh, is there any fundamental source of the coherence? Because I was talking about the interaction between the system and the environment. Now, let me make a semi-classical argument, not from the point of view of, of quantum optics, but from the point of gravitation. Huh? It's like that. Suppose you have a mass and you produce a superposition of two states of the mass in which the mass is localized in different spatial positions. Okay? So it's like you know, the, the states that Einstein was worried about. Huh? You have a superposition of localized states. But you have a mass here. A mass can be in a superposition of this state and this state, localized. Now, if the mass is here, it will deform the space-time because of its position. That's a semi-classical argument, huh? because I'm not using quantum gravity here. It deforms the space-time here. If it is here, it will deform locally the space-time here. So you see, in some way, the space-time is measuring the position of the mass because it's being deformed, locally deformed. Now, if the space-time is measuring the position of the mass, that means that it's going to destroy the coherence. Okay? So you see, uh, uh, the connection with general relativity might lead to a fundamental the coherence cause. Okay? And that's, of course, a very interesting problem. It could be, uh, there are people who are investigating this using uh, nanoscopic mirrors or mesoscopic mirrors uh, who are interacting with some optical fields, uh, could be micro optical fields. Uh, and and uh, by using the techniques that Serge has mentioned to you, that you can build you know, Schrodinger cat states of, of these fields in the cavities, you can actually produce a, uh, an entangled state between the, between the mirror and the field in the cavity because you know, different states would lead to different uh, uh, pressures on the mirror. This is an electromagnetic uh, pressure. So you have the superposition of these two mirror states. And if, there is, if this deformation of space-time is effective, that would lead to fundamental decoherence. Of course, in order to do that, you have to first eliminate all other causes of the coherence, or yet know how they behave. Know about the dynamics, because you don't need necessarily to eliminate all the possible causes of the coherence if the dynamics differ from the decoherence produced by this deformation of space-time. Okay? So there are some people doing that. Uh, Aspel Meyer uh, in, in, in Austria, Baumister in California. They are trying hard. Fortunately for them, they have intermediate results that are interesting because this is you know, a very uh, daring and long-range, I think, plan. But I find it fascinating you know, that with the low energy physics, you could probe such a fundamental thing. I think this was an original idea of Penrose. Who... That was an original idea of Penrose, yes. So that just shows that, you know, since 1935, when Heinstein and Schrodinger were discussing these things, up to nowadays, this, this field has gone a long way. And uh, it's interesting because uh, the questions are not all answered. There are still uh, lots of challenges. Even for quantum computation, there are challenges of, of protecting the system against the coherence, of course, so that you can scale it up. So I think it's, uh, we are talking actually about a field which is still very, very active. And, and I think it's, it's very challenging and extremely interesting. So, in, in view of the uh, time, I think we should uh, conclude here and thank Luis again.